Okay, let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for attending tonight's webinar on homelessness that speaks to the outreach and support that's being provided to people experiencing homelessness. Our first presenter for this evening will be the Chicago Department of Family Support Services. Uh, we are joined tonight uh, by Deputy Commissioner Maura McCauley and Director of Human Services, Chandra Libby. Oh, and Chandra, just give me one second. I will pull up the presentation. Thank you, um, Alderman Kappelman um, and Kylie and Maggie for organizing this and inviting us uh, to share all of the work happening um, to address homelessness across the city of Chicago. I'm Maura McCauley. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Homeless and Domestic Violence Services at DFSS. Um, my colleague, Chandra Libby, I think is, is trying to join. She's having some tech issues, so she'll hopefully be with me shortly. And we're also joined, with, joined by our Managing Deputy Commissioner, Elisa Rodriguez. Next slide. So we wanted to just give an overview of um, the work that, that DFSS does as our, around homeless services. So in general, the strategies that we use to prevent and end homelessness are focused on first preventing Chicagoans from becoming homeless whenever possible through things like financial assistance, rental assistance, and supports like that. Then if people do become homeless, that we are managing a safe, efficient, and accessible shelter and outreach system that is equipped to support people experiencing homelessness when they do become homeless. And then three, that we have um, an available and ready and affordable housing stock to connect people back to permanent housing as quickly as possible. These are the strategies and the goals that we are working towards collectively at DFSS, along with our delegate agencies, other city departments, and our local continuum of care. DFSS um, primarily manages um, contracts in this arena, but we do have a city-staffed homelessness outreach team, um, the, the HOP team, which provides direct outreach um, to people experiencing homelessness, um, who are living outside on trains um, in places not meant for human habitation. And we, they also coordinate um, different encampment initiatives, such as um, facilitating our mobile health work in coordination um, with CDPH, which you'll hear a, a little bit about from that team, different housing events and encampment cleanings. Our homeless division manages a portfolio of about 53 million. This was before the Chicago recovery plan. So this is our base funding. We fund 52 delegate agencies um, serving our, at 96 different sites throughout Chicago. So our portfolio is generally within what we, we generally uh, describe the crisis response system. Our largest area of funding um, is shelter. We fund 75% 75, 75 of the shelter beds um, in the city of Chicago, um, which is emergency housing for families, youth, single adults, survivors of domestic violence. Um, it also includes our low barrier shelter, which is really targeted to encourage people who wouldn't typically come inside to shelter to come inside and is a big part of our encampment work. Um, our next largest portfolio is around outreach and engagement. Um, we fund 13 different delegate agencies conducting street outreach. And then we also fund 10 drop-in centers for youth and adults across the city. We fund, um, typically fund supports in, in permanent supportive housing, so support services, but housing is not our primary thing. You'll hear about some exciting housing initiatives that we have been able to do um, with innovations in funding, but also um, the significant amount of a recovery funding that has come our way um, because of the pandemic. We also fund rental assistance on the prevention side of things as well. And I also want to acknowledge that two of our delegate agencies are here today, Cornerstone and um, Sarah Circle. So we look forward to hearing from them as well. Next slide. Just to ground us in the data, um, we, um, we look at data around people experiencing homelessness um, in many different ways. 
you probably heard many different data sets. Um, there's numbers that include doubled up households, um, Chicago public schools, students in temporary living situations, um, measures the number of uh, students in schools who are experiencing homelessness. And another one that we use consistently is the point in time count. DFSS conducts a point in time count every year as part of a federal um, requirement from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. It is a snapshot of the number of people um, experiencing homelessness at the end of the year, uh, sorry, at the end of January every year. Um, and it really just helps us understand who is experiencing homelessness and what are their needs. This is not a comprehensive be all end all data set. We look at all of them, but this, uh, this piece of data is something that we're able to do every year at the same time. So it helps give us an idea in general, how are we doing on this definition um, of people who are either living in shelter or on the streets um, in January every year. Um, so just to share our most recent pit, uh, the most recent pit count that we have results for um, is the 2021 count um, where we had 4,477 total residents experiencing homelessness. About 3,000 of those were um, in the shelter and a little over 1,400 um, were residing in unsheltered locations. I do wanna note that um, the unsheltered count was modified because of COVID-19 last year. Um, so it's not comparable to our past years, but we wanted to share our current data. Um, usually we do a full city um, census tract count on the night of the count. Um, and because of COVID precautions, um, we used um, professional outreach teams um, in a sample of locations that have been weighted. Um, to just give you a comparison of how Chicago looks um, compared to the five largest um, cities across the country, we're sharing um, the 2020 data, which was our last comprehensive count pre-COVID to show how we um, stack up. So back in 2020, our count was 5,390, 72% um, um, were in shelter and the remainder were on the street. At that time, it was a 2% increase that we were seeing. So we're sharing the 2021 data to show you where we are. Um, it also reflects um, shelter decompression that was happening. So the sheltered count, while it was conducted with our usual methodology, the number of shelter beds in the system was reduced and the number of people in the system were reduced um, in 2021 because of the COVID pandemic and safety precautions. Next slide. Um, so in our division, before I jump into housing initiatives and work that we're doing specifically in the 46th ward, um, we also just wanna ground um, our presentation in the continuous performance improvement that we've been embarking on as a department. Um, I think uh, as a field, the homelessness system is constantly looking at innovation and change. And at DFSS, we are no different. We've been partnering with the Harvard government uh, performance lab to um, embark on some different performance improvement um, strategies. Um, namely active contract management, which is one I'll just talk about tonight, um, which is really a strategy for working closely with our delegate agencies to monitor key data in real time and get their insights about what is and isn't working and then making action steps for improvement. So we did this in 2018 um, with uh, two co cohorts of shelter providers to really help us understand how we could increase exits to permanent housing and decrease the length of stay in shelter. If you remember the first, the three um, goals that I shared for our system, those are um, really critical pieces. And we were seeing um, a reduction in, in the amount of exits to permanent housing and longer stays in shelter. And we know we need to be moving people more quickly into housing to free up shelter beds and to reduce the trauma people are experiencing while they are experiencing homelessness. Um, so we had a successful um, cohort um, with our shelters, um, with providers that covered 75% of our shelter beds that we funded. Um, and in this year, we just started um, last month to embark on the same 
process with our outreach providers to really focus on ensuring that we have citywide outreach coverage, that we are improving service connections to individuals and that we are using best practices um, in the work that we're doing. So this will come into play um, in some of our outreach and all of our outreach efforts across the city with our delegates and the HOP team. Next slide. So one of the biggest causes of homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. And we know that housing is the solution to homelessness. Um, and so DFSS and many of our partners, um, including the county, um, other city departments, managed care organizations, hospital systems, and other systems that have crisis response systems have been working to create um, innovative ways to fund and expand more units of permanent supportive housing. Um, and in 2018, the city was the foundational um, investor with support of Alderman Kappelman um, to launch the flexible housing pool, um, which is focused on um, creating a mechanism to join public and private funding sources that would typically be siloed into one funding pool um, toward a common goal um, using unified administrative practices and service practices to house um, Chicago and county residents who are um, high utilizers of crisis response systems. And so there's a housing coordination agency, the Center for Housing and Health, who administers the program, facilitates the rent and housing location and funds service partners and outreach partners who are housing um, Chicago and county residents. And so we've, we're excited that we've been able to house 487 households with a flexible housing pool. Many of them are, you know, were previously um, experiencing homelessness and living on the street. The second really exciting initiative um, that we've been able to focus on is the expedited housing initiative. Um, when the CARES Act funding from the federal government came um, to address the pandemic, um, some of the funding that came directly to DFSS for homelessness had, you know, was able to go towards housing. And I said earlier, we don't typically fund housing. We know that when we have dedicated resources for housing, we've proven that we are able to house people and reduce homelessness. Um, so it was kind of a no brainer that we invested um, $35 million of that funding towards rapid rehousing um, for Chicagoans experiencing homelessness. Um, to launch the expedited housing initiative um, with the Chicago Continuum of Care. So we house people through a process called accelerated moving events. Um, they basically are events that expedite and, and improve the process of helping people move into housing. It's one day events um, where individuals complete um, several steps of the housing process at one time. So they're able to fill out, you know, select a unit, fill out applications, um, select furniture from the Chicago Furniture Bank and begin their housing process and then move into housing. Um, in typically it's taking about 45 to 60 days to help people move in, um, which is a reduction from our previous time. Um, we have housed, as of last week, we've housed over 1,600 individuals through the, accelerate, the expedited housing initiative. And of that group, 320 households were housed from encampment, accelerated moving events. Chandra's team has coordinated with outreach teams to um, have accelerated moving events that were focused on individual encampments across the city, or some just included referrals from outreach providers um, throughout the city. I think one thing that's relevant to our conversation today is that we've been doing this for about a year and a half. Um, We've offered opportunities multiple times at several locations, including in an uptown. Um, and it takes sometimes several times and several AMEs and opportunities of engaging people to join a particular event before people decide to uh, take up the offer. Um, one particular success story is at an encampment in Chinatown where the teams um, engaged, I think over four times um, for, for four different events, got very little take up. And at our most recent accelerated moving event, 23 of 25 people moved into housing from that encampment and that it's, um, it, it's significantly reduced. Um, but it just is part of the engagement process 
taking time to engage and build trust with individuals and, and they're there when they feel ready to take up um, resources. And part of it, I think, was also proving that it worked. Um, and so with the Chicago recovery plan, we will continue to build on that expedited housing initiative and to continue to invest in rapid rehousing to continue the next phase of the expedited housing initiative. We are also working on shelter infrastructure um, projects to help transition our shelter facilities um, from that are, not, that are larger congregate facilities to non-congregate, meaning individual rooms um, with, you know, reduced sharing of bathrooms and spaces because that has been proven to be a best practice throughout the pandemic. It led to you know, better housing outcomes, better um, you know, reduction in trauma symptoms and just higher um, uptakes of healthcare partnerships that we were able to bring into the shelters that were operating non-congregate during the pandemic. So we're looking to expand that. And then we will be investing in additional permanent housing um, and service initiatives to continue to expand housing opportunities for people experiencing homelessness. Um, the, the reduction, um, the, we, we did increase um, our housing placements into permanent housing with a combination of these efforts um, in 2021. Next slide. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Chandra Libby, who's gonna just speak more specifically about uh, targeted outreach activities that we have been doing in the 46th Ward. Chandra. Um, please let me know if you cannot hear me. Good evening, I'm Chandra Libby. I'm the Director for the Homeless Outreach and Prevention Program with the Department of Family and Support Services. So what I'm gonna provide you right now is just kind of an understanding of the work we've done in the area uh, up north um, during the past year, year, maybe three months, year and three months. Um, so the encampment AMEs, just to explain a little bit about what they are, these are in-person events that allow participants to connect to rapid rehousing. Um, they, they look at uh, units at the time, um, they complete applications, they get on-site on assistance with applications. And then the last process, a last, last part of the process is selecting furniture. Um, residents of Lakeshore Drive, Viaduct, uh, encampments in Uptown and other areas on the north side were notified and transported to three AMEs between February and December of 2021. From these AMEs, a total of 30 individuals were housed. Um, residents of Lakeshore Drive were also invited to participate in AMEs in April and March and April of this year, 2022, but all declined um, that we were able to engage, scan, and we did multiple outreaches uh, trying to encourage clients during the day as well as at night. Um, encampment initiatives are supportive services uh, coordinated by DFSS and other city departments and delegate agencies um, as part of the city's encampment strategy. It's a multi-level approach based on the size of the encampment. At the uh, identified encampment, the teams assess the needs of residents, continuously engage the residents and connect residents to shelter and other resources. Um, an encampment initiative took place September 14th through the 16th of 2021 at the Lakeshore Drive Viaducts, Wilson and Lawrence. Um, and it also included the park area. Um, six individuals approached the vehicle and requested assistance and they were provided with medical assistance and treatment, transportation and shelter placement. I was invite, uh, provided to one individual and four individuals uh, were assessed for housing uh, through the coordinated entry program. Um, we also had done several encampment cleanings, which is a coordination or collaboration between um, DSSS, uh, Streets and Sanitation, um, Family and Support Services, HOP teams, um, and whoever else, Chicago Park District. Um, the encampments in this area in Uptown, we recently did um, monthly encampments for the past, I wanna say uh, five months. And it also included the parks um, 
between Montrose and Lawrence and all of the viaducts, I mean, the viaducts under Wilson and Lawrence. Next slide, please. Okay, we just wanted to let you know also that anyone can, uh, anyone in Chicago can call 311 and ask for a shelter placement. Um, the assistance is available 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, a dispatcher will provide triage, referral, transportation of individuals and families to open shelter beds across the city. And residents can also go to the Northside Area Community Center at 845 West Wilson for connection to shelter placement as well as other resources Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you. Is that it then? Okay, perfect. All right, so uh, thank you, Maura, Alyssa, and Chandra. Um, Aldermen are known to work seven days a week and I know the same is true with Mara and Chandra. Uh, so I'm now going to turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Matthew Richards from the Chicago Department of Public Health. Thank you, Alderman. Thanks to Maggie and Kylie for um, convening this. Uh, my name is Matt Richards. I'm uh, the Deputy Commissioner uh, for Behavioral Health um, at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training. Uh, my background is in um, uh, serious mental illness and addiction treatment. Um, I'm joined by uh, my colleagues, Dr. Wilnice Jasmine, who's the medical director of behavioral health at the health department, uh, Tiffany Patton Burnside, who's our uh, senior director of crisis services, and also Sarah Richardson, who's uh, one of our project managers. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking tonight really about two things. So one is just providing a general sort of overview in terms of a health profile of people experiencing homelessness in the United States, which highlights um, some of the particular um, health risk factors that people experiencing homelessness um, experience and, and are related to the shape of our programs at the health department. And then going to be talking about some of the specific CDPH programs um, that address the intersection of health and homelessness um, in Chicago. Um, this is a growing area of focus for us at the health department. There's, um, we've increased our mental health budget uh, by sevenfold over the last three years. Um, I'm really appreciative to Alderman Kappelman, who's been um, one of our most um, reliable and uh, vocal advocates for people living with serious mental illness and their families. So I'm appreciative to him for the support he's provided. Um, so first of all, you know, when you look at life expectancy for um, people experiencing homelessness in the United States, people experiencing homelessness on average die 12 years um, before people who are not experiencing homelessness. And this is due to a wide range of untreated behavioral health conditions, namely serious mental illness, uh, substance use disorders. Uh, there's also a variety of communicable or infectious diseases that folks are more at risk for acquiring. Um, uh, uh, injuries associated with elemental exposure, uh, trauma, and then of course, untreated chronic health conditions, heart disease, cancer, particularly head and neck cancer, alcohol use disorder, liver disease, um, et cetera. And so our programs uh, attempt to address sort of the range of chronic physical health conditions and behavioral health conditions. Um, you know, there's a study that was just finished uh, uh, about a year ago at Harvard that looked at um, 60,000 adults experiencing homelessness in Boston um, and causes of death in that population over time and found that 24% of persons experiencing homelessness who died, died due to a drug overdose, uh, most of which was connected to opioids. And so the role that um, untreated substance use disorders play, particularly related to chronic homelessness among adults, is a major area of focus for us. Um, uh, it's a significant risk factor for premature mortality, uh, but also can lead to a lot of um, instability um, in terms of an ability to be successful in permanent supportive housing. So addressing it is, is a key priority. Secondly, we know from the research that approximately half of people experiencing homelessness, again, I'm primarily talking about uh, chronically homeless single adults, are, are living with um, an untreated mental health condition. So we know that about a third of people are living with serious mental illness. And when I say serious mental illness, what I mean 
is schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Um, so schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. I also mean very severe forms of bipolar disorder and major depression. And I also mean personality disorders, um, particularly that co-occur with substance use. So we know that a third of, of folks um, are, are living with one of those conditions, uh, typically and often untreated. And we see high rates of depression um, and trauma among people experiencing homelessness. So when we're looking at the shape of our programs at the health department, we're really trying to map them onto some of the health risks that I just described. So as I mentioned, you know, you, you may be familiar with the, the city's sort of history of funding of mental health. Um, going back to 2019, which was the last budget of the, the prior mayoral administration, you know, we had a, a, a mental health budget of approximately $12 million. Um, this year, it's $90 million uh, or almost $90 million. Um, and you see on the slide uh, our ability to really significantly scale up services. So our team is expecting on, on providing services to 60,000 residents this year um, as compared to a little over 3,500 at the prior funding level in 2019. And that's uh, particularly important for this conversation because we have a growing body of work that is specifically focused on the intersection of homelessness and untreated uh, behavioral health conditions. So I'm going to highlight um, about five different investments that we're making. There's other things we could talk about. And during the Q&A, if, if people have questions, happy to respond to those. So what, one thing you know, that we are doing increasingly is we are funding um, team-based mental health care. So you may be familiar with models called assertive community treatment and community support teams. So these are teams of mental health professionals that deliver mental health services in an ongoing way to people in the community. So they work outside the brick and mortar walls of clinics. Um, actually, Trilogy Behavioral Health is one of our um, ACT CST partners that we fund, um, who's on the um, this webinar tonight. And we have partnered with DFSS during COVID. We began doing this for individuals that were being prioritized for housing through the expedited housing initiative that they could get priority placement onto an ACT or CST team. And the reason why that's important is that we know we increase the prospects of somebody being stable uh, in their housing if they're getting treatment for their underlying uh, mental health condition. And so we often don't set people up for success if they're just moved or transitioned into supportive housing without the appropriate level of, of support. Second thing is we're delivering health care both in the encampment setting, which our colleagues from DFSS referenced through the Heartland Health Outreach Ban, and then we are we also work and fund the night ministry to do basically the same services across the train system. And so that's primary care, psychiatric care, starting people on medication assisted treatment for substance use disorders, a range of case management, ultimately with the goal of trying to uh, help people achieve stability so they can be transitioned into permanent supportive housing. The third thing, and this is something we've worked with Alderman Kappelman on, I'm really excited about it is we're standing up um, a 60 unit, uh, we're looking at purchasing uh, a hotel or, or some similar facility, 60 units, where um, individuals will be able to have their own unit plus get primary care, psychiatric care, substance use care in their home. And the individuals that would be prioritized for this are individuals who are high utilizers of our 911 system, police services, EMS services, so they can be directly diverted into this option. If they consent, they can stay there for up to six months. And then the goal is for us to have developed a good treatment plan, um, developed a relationship so we understand the level of supports that they'll need as they're transitioned into permanent supportive housing in the community. And I think this is filling a gap that we've had for a long time, that we have a lot of individuals who cycle through emergency rooms may receive 72 hours of care, which is not enough care to achieve the level of stability that, that one would need. Um, we also have started to work, we've really integrated primary care, psychiatric care, SUD care now, substance use disorder uh, treatment across our, our, our shelter system. So that's a significant undertaking. Again, something we did during the pandemic. And, and worked closely with our colleagues from DFSS um, to do that. So this is an expanding body of work. Everything that I've described is new in the last two-ish years. So um, it's, it's a growing body of work uh, for us. Um, 
Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention is that we have a new um, alternate response program um, that embeds mental health professionals both into our 911 call center and in response teams that answer 911 calls. This is a, uh, a pilot. It is being piloted in your community. And so um, it's, I think it's relevant for you to, to be aware of that if you, you yourself, uh, a neighbor, a loved one, if you see someone on the street um, who appears to be experiencing a mental health crisis, you can call 911. Um, Monday through Friday, we're operating around eight, uh, nine to five o'clock. Um, we anticipate those hours will expand as the pilot continues. Um, you can request a care team through 911 and um, our teams will respond. So we have two teams. One is in uh, your neck of the woods, Uptown, Lakeview, North Center. And then we have another team on the south side. We have a third team that's starting on the southwest side in the next week or two here. So this is, again, another example of us trying to uh, better address crises when they occur and get people connected to the right systems of care so that we can interrupt that cycling dynamic that we see a lot. Um, so far, this is this data is actually over a month old. We've now served over 200. We've responded over 200 911 calls at this point. Uh, no use of force, no arrests, minimal. Um, uh, I think we've only had to certify two, position, uh, two petitions so far. We've made great use in your community of the psychiatric living room that thresholds operate. So we've been transporting some patients there. Um, uh, I think we continue to work on uh, getting people connected uh, to same day mental health treatment and SUD treatment. Um, so th I think that's something, and, and I've discussed it with the aldermen that I think we wanna continue to work with um, uh, uh, you all on and, and hearing your feedback about what you think that should look like. Um, this shows the communities um, that we intend on uh, launching the pilot in. Um, you, uh, I've shared the slides with the alderman and his staff, so they can certainly share this with you, and you can always feel free to reach out to our team if you have questions. Um, and I just wanted to make you aware of the, suit, the city's new mental health website. Um, it, uh, feature, it There's a resource finder that has um, you can search uh, uh, via your zip code, and it populates um, lots of different clinics that we directly fund or we directly operate that deliver care regardless of ability to pay health insurance status or immigration status. It also features stories of uh, residents around the city sharing their mental health journeys. Um, that's what I have for you uh, this evening. I'm excited to, to answer questions uh, that you might have um, and hearing your ideas. And, and again, appreciate the, the invitation and the support that we've gotten from Alderman Kappelman on all the stuff we're working on. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. It's always good to hear from another fellow social worker, especially one who understands the importance of improving systems and the delivery of care. I'm now going to invite uh, the new executive director of Cornerstone Community Outreach, Andrew Winters, uh, to present. Andrew? Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you, Alderman Kappelman, for the invitation to be present here tonight. Um, yes, I'm Andrew Winter, the newly appointed Executive Director of Cornerstone Community Outreach. Uh, Cornerstone is a delegate agency of the DFSS, providing shelter for families, men and women experiencing homelessness uh, in Chicago. And forgive me, I have contracted COVID, and so if I cough, I'll try to mute. Um, thank you. And really think about COVID and the pandemic and what it's shown us here on the ground level, you know, as a delegate of the DFSS and partner, new partner kind of with CDPH too, is that we really are all in this together. You know, we can all contract the same disease, have the same care needs, and really we can help protect and care for each other too. And the similarity in how the symptoms of COVID, both short term and long haul, affect us and the effects it can really have on our behavioral wellness. Um, you know, increased isolation can cause a real sense of aloneness and depression. Uh, this has caused trauma to like a whole new generation of people, and the effects are already showing. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it is trauma that is a primary factor of how like each of us will interact in the future. And understanding this in the lives of those experiencing homelessness, that trauma affects both conscious and subconscious decision making. Um, and if we can operate from a, a place of trauma informed care, you know, we can be present to the person we are serving. So, like when someone is enrolled in one of Cornerstone's programs, of course, the most obvious need is housing. Um, but that's like the cover to a book. Inside of it, though, is where the author shares the story and kind of like deeper needs of theirs. Some of the basic human needs like a safe place to sleep, food, clothing, and personal hygiene. And those deeper ones present themselves in time. And so Cornerstone is a place where those very you know, basic human needs can be met as a, a space of comfort 
and to really kind of build that trust. Um, and like their medical and behavioral wellness needs may take time to present themselves and be shared. You know, the underlying undiagnosed and untreated things that both, you know, CDPH talked about and DFSS. Um, excuse me for one second here. <clears throat> And so then through the pandemic, I, you know, we've been grateful to see the major movements that CDPH and DFSS have done to address these needs in a more comprehensive way. You know, like, for example, they coordinated the testing for COVID, uh, shielding medically vulnerable people in different hotels from it, and coordinating care for the people who contracted it. You know, they activated and are increasing shelter-based health care and behavioral health care and COVID testing and vaccines over time. And like really strengthening partnerships between places like Cornerstone and Heartland Alliance Health, Londell Christian Health Center, Rush, and UIC. Uh, the DFSS talked about one-time funding uh, through the CARES Act earlier. They funded some things and then also the American Rescue Plan to improve shelter and increasing housing subsidies. And uh, they mentioned the 1,600 uh, households that have already been housed through that expedited housing initiative. And just last week at Cornerstone, there was another uh, AME accelerated moving event that may lead to another 30 households. So those moves have really been helpful in this very difficult time, right? And I think about shelters, kind of like an emergency room of a hospital. You know, they aren't where you're supposed to stay long-term. They're where you have your needs triaged and then move to where you need to get next. Uh, that may be supportive housing or nursing care or fully independent permanent housing. And shelters just fit in that kind of spectrum between, you know, being unhoused and fully independent again. And um, in a city as large as Chicago, there most likely always be a need for something resembling shelters. You know, many individuals and families' lives can be turned upside down in an instant, and they need somewhere to land. Imagine the one thing, I guess, that could happen to you personally uh, that would leave you without any place to be at night and no one to turn to. And that's the very thing that could have happened to the person sleeping outside or doubled up that is calling through and one, like Chandra mentioned, looking for shelter. And then each person in their specific moment, you know, is unique from everyone else. And so it's like our responsibilities to see them, like really see them, to humanize each person and hope for the best for them. You know, that's the, the hope in the work at shelters, right? That we get to be there in the midst of this hopefully very brief moment in a life, you know, where they don't have someone, you know, they're turning to the system because right then they have no one to turn to, but strangers. Like last year at Cornerstone, we provided shelter to uh, for around 450 people across the course of the year. And, and looking at the stats I have here, which I didn't do a screenshot for you guys, sorry. But the reality is 29% of them were children experiencing homelessness that came through Cornerstone. Uh, 22% of the people who came were over the age of 51. 30% of all the clients came from sleeping outside the night before in a car or in a tent. 65% have uh, some form of physical disability or chronic medical or behavioral health issue. And 35% came from a violent or unstable family situation, half of which were families with children fleeing domestic violence. So my hope is always that shelter is not needed, but the reality is for now, I hope needs to be adjusted to since shelter is needed. Let's make the best model of shelter possible, you know, invest in it and also invest in the long-term housing solutions. And that's the work that um, the two departments, public health and family support services have been doing really well. And I want to acknowledge department of housing also over this last two years, really seeing the, the problem in this moment and how to address it. You know, there is enough public funding that can be made available and there's enough private citizens with disposable income that the right investment could be made to enhance the existing shelters uh, to be those more welcoming, caring, individualized spaces and to create that sustainable revenue for affordable housing. You know, that's, that's the objective is affordable housing, housing first, right? Uh, it's hard to come by when they're already full, but the goal is to create new spaces and new relationships. It's like the city is working with its ARPA funds to convert shelters to be non-congregate and to invest in permanent housing too. Um, when I think about non-congregate shelters, I picture like the Holiday Inn with the right social work staff and medical staff to meet each person's needs. And, you know, the right kind of investment, you know, thinking about um, 
Bring Chicago Home proposal to restructure a one-time tax on high dollar properties when they're sold, uh, that could create a sustainable revenue. And so there's a lot of good movements and all these things work together. They take that time, but if we are working on it right now, we can address the, that immediate need, you know, to expand the, the outreach and shelter services. So that way we can, uh, you know, strengthen that part of this continuum, uh, but really the goal to help people get housed. Uh, so I'm grateful to be part of this conversation. Um, to, with these organizations and departments and then also, you know, are my neighbors, you know, uh, I live right here in Uptown and I want to be a solution to make the most safe, inclusive, welcoming neighborhood we can. Uh, so thank you. Um, sorry to prepare a slideshow. Uh, I didn't cough more than once. So that's great. But I look forward to this discussion. Uh, thank you, Alderman. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that presentation and being with us this evening. The, the fact that you're doing this while you have COVID speaks so highly of your commitment to help others in need. And I've, I've personally witnessed you uh, interacting with people who are experiencing homelessness and you have such a calming presence as you interact with them. I am now going to turn it over to the Director of Program Services and Administration at Sarah Circle, uh, Angela Lopez. Okay, thank you. Um... Let me share my screen here. All right. Uh, so yes, I'm Angela Lopez with Sarah's Circle, uh, Director of Program Services and Administration. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here this evening to be part of this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to sharing more uh, about Sarah's Circle with you. Um, so our mission here at Sarah's Circle is, okay. Oh, my button, there we go. Um, our mission here at Sarah Circle is to end homelessness for women in Chicago. And we do this by providing a full continuum of services, uh, including housing, life necessities, and supportive services. Um, our vision is for every woman in Chicago to have a safe and secure home and for each woman to, not, to no longer be in a cycle of housing instability. Um, in uh, fulfilling this mission, uh, in 2021, we served 850 women across all of our programs. Uh, you'll see that the largest number of women we serviced, uh, we serviced through our daytime support center, followed by interim housing, which is our shelter program, follow it, followed by rapid rehousing. Um, and permanent supportive housing. Um, and the reason for that is our daytime support center can be thought of as a front door of sorts. Um, it is uh, one of, it's our primary entry point, not the only entry point, but uh, women access the daytime support center um, in, order to, uh, in order to be connected to the next step. Sometimes they often, they don't know what to do next. Um, the shelter, um, provides relief from the immediate crisis. Um, so we do see, of course, a lot of women coming into our interim housing uh, so that they have housing, uh, they, have, they have protection um, while they're actually working on housing stability. So here you see a snapshot of who we provide service to. Um, you can also get an idea as you look at the list of the barriers that uh, our clients can face uh, to housing stability. Um, of course, it's of no surprise that 100% of our clients are of low income. 51% of those clients have no income. Um, something else uh, that is definitely worth mentioning and that was mentioned um, earlier this evening is, uh, is that mental health is something that we're seeing uh, a very significant need for the, the, um, the need for mental health to be addressed. 34% of our clients have a mental health diagnosis, um, but we do see a lot of people who need the diagnosis. When they come in, they, um, they, they need access to an evaluation and, um, and to a diagnosis. Uh, so really that 34% is, is underrepresented. Um, also, um, I will just point out that uh, there at the top, you see 8% are fleeing domestic violence. 
Um, that means that 8% at the moment they enter shelter, the reason they're here is they're actively fleeing domestic violence. Uh, but when you look at the number of people who have domestic violence in their history, it goes way up um, to 30, 40%. Um, because even though domestic violence may, may not be the reason some of our clients are with us now, um, it is something that uh, they have as part of their past and it started the snowball to where they are now. Um, so it's really more of a, a substantial reason than this 8% would represent. Uh, so here you see our continuum of services. Um, again, our daytime support center is like a front door. Uh, it's also a safe place for clients to spend the day. Um, it provides them an address if they don't have anywhere for mail to go. Uh, we provide three meals daily, um, heat, air conditioning, shower, uh, and case management. And as I mentioned, this is where they can be connected to what they need to actually uh, become stably housed. Um, our interim housing is our shelter program and uh, it provides a safe place to spend both the day and the night um, while they're working on a plan to attain housing stability. Um, rapid rehousing, which was also talked about earlier this evening, um, is a program that started during the pandemic to try and uh, move people into stable housing and uh, provide more space in, in shelters for people who need it. The goal with rapid rehousing uh, is for clients to become placed within 30 days of case management. Um, and it's of course aimed at those who are, uh, who are in a situation where they can um, maintain the housing. Um, we also have a pilot program that we're working on that is somewhat similar to rapid rehousing um, called, uh, it's a diversion program. Um, in order to be part of this rapid rehousing program right here, you don't need to be housed with Sarah Circle. Um, for our pilot diversion program, uh, we are specifically working with women who are in our interim housing program to see if we're able to divert them to housing within 14 days, um, which is definitely providing some valuable learning um, regarding what that takes. Um, we also have a permanent supportive housing program, um, which as the name suggests, provides permanent a permanent solution along with ongoing support as is needed by the client. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more. Um, our daytime program is located at 4838 North Sheridan, where we've been since 2013. Um, and here you see um, a few uh, snapshots of that program. So here we have the daytime area um, where our clients will be during the daytime. This is where they would eat. We also do quite a few activities with them. We have a large volunteer network and they'll come in and, um, and, and do activities that range from, you know, fun to educational um, to, um, you know, something that may have to do with, um, you know, handling stress, uh, for example. Um, here, uh, you see a group of volunteers actually preparing a meal for our clients in our daytime program. Um, and right here, um, we see a woman cooking. This is a snapshot from one of our permanent supportive housing apartments. Uh, so located right next to 4838 North Sheridan, we have 10 of our permanent supportive housing apartments. Um, and um, this is a snapshot of, from, from a kitchen of one. We also very close by have Sarah's on Sheridan, um, which opened in 2021. Um, it is on Sheridan and Leland. Uh, the bottom two floors that you see here are our shelter program. So this is where we have uh, our multi-purpose area where clients spend time during the day where they eat. Um, and then on the second floor is where we actually have our shelter program. So we have 50 beds um, in the shelter program. Uh, and right here above uh, the third through sixth floors, 
we have our permanent supportive housing studio unit uh, apartments. Um, and here you can see what that looks like. Uh, so uh, right here on what I believe is your upper right, uh, we have a picture of one of the per permanent supportive housing units. It's a studio apartment. Um, when the client moves in, um, they have everything they need. They have pots, pans, towels. They do have their own bathroom. They have their own um, you know, small uh, kitchen. Um, and so it is a private space uh, for the clients who live there. In uh, the building um, at Sarah's on Sheridan, we have 38 of these units. Um, here you see uh, our multi-purpose area for our shelter clients. So this is again, where they would do activities just like in the daytime program. Um, and uh, we would also have volunteers work with them in any number of ways. Um, and then uh, this is our, our kitchen. We need commercial, a commercial kitchen because we are cooking for so many uh, at this location. Um, soon we will have Sarah to, Sarah's on Lakeside. Uh, you can see a map here um, where, you know, we have uh, the daytime support center um, and 10 of our PSH units, Sarah's on Sheridan that I was just showing you. And then we will have Sarah's on Lakeside that will be on Sheridan and Lakeside. And this will provide uh, 28 more units uh, that will be studio apartments through the permanent supportive housing program. Uh, so you may be asking, uh, what can you do? Um, and there are some things that you can do. Uh, one of them would be to refer women experiencing homelessness or at risk to the daytime support center. Uh, you have the address here, the hours, phone number, um, because again, this is where, you know, we can do any number of things. We can connect them to emergency funds as well. So if someone is at risk, that's something that can actually, emergency funds can help that person never become homeless in the first place. Um, you know, we can also uh, help them call 311. It may be, you know, somewhat intimidating for someone. Um, and certainly it would be more comfortable to wait inside after they call 311. So, um, you know, just reaching out for help sometimes is, is difficult. Uh, so if you have someone there to help you uh, take that next step, it can be really helpful. Um, and, uh, and so referring to our daytime support center is definitely a way to help somebody access the help they need. Um, we also, like I said, have a very large volunteer program, but we're always eager to uh, accept more volunteers. Our volunteers um, do a lot of really interesting things. Uh, we have volunteers come in and cook a meal, play live music, which is always really well received, provide health screenings, uh, facilitate an activity, and provide haircuts. These are examples, you know, someone here may have an idea um, that hasn't been done before. It doesn't mean that it couldn't be done. Uh, and if, uh, if you would like to volunteer, then we would ask that you please contact Jojo, our volunteer relations associate. Here's her um, phone number, email address, um, and, um, and then she'll, she'll take it from there. So uh, I look forward to questions later on. Um, and again, uh, thank you so much to Alderman Kappelman for having us here. Uh, this is a great opportunity, great conversation. Thank you, Angela. Sarah Circle is beyond amazing and the work they do to address the needs of women reaches across this entire city. Um, Sarah Circle has grown exponentially during the time I've been an alderman with two new buildings and another one on the way. So, and it's extremely extraordinarily difficult to get funding to build new affordable housing, but Sarah Circle has proven over and over again that they are up to the task. Our final presenter this evening, before we open up the floor to uh, questions and answers, is uh, Trilogy Health. We have Christopher Mayer and Katie Alshuler to present. Thanks, Alderman Kappelman. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chris Mayer, and I'm the clinical director of Trilogy's alternative crisis team. So here to just talk super briefly on the intersection of mental health crisis and homelessness in Uptown. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick here. 
So um, Trilogy, for anyone who's not aware, is a behavioral health organization. And we've been in the Uptown area since um, 1971, actually, when we were founded. So we have, in the past year, under a state program, been able to implement an alternative crisis team um, tasked with providing immediate response mental health services for people in Uptown, as well as Edgewater, West Ridge, Rogers Park, and then a couple North suburbs. So what that program looks like is that two crisis response workers will arrive to meet with someone who calls for support um, anywhere they're looking for support. So that could be inside a home for someone who's housed, or it could be outside a building, you know, in a park, in an encampment, wherever someone is requesting support. And what we're providing in those meetings is compassionate engagement and assessment, um, you know, working with a person to help regulate, offer choices and make a safety plan, as well as then provide follow-up services. So the crisis team works with people for about 90 days or so to provide stabilization and help people transition to longer term supports. So how do we fit into the continuum of housing supports in Uptown? Um, there are a lot of great organizations working on um, supporting people with housing in Uptown. So we wanna be intentional sort of how we engage within that. So as a crisis team, we're not primarily a housing program, but can be a support to those organizations working in housing and people who are unhoused. So we respond to crisis incidents and work with many individuals who are currently unhoused um, to build rapport and engage into care as well as work towards housing opportunities. So sort of in the initial incident, we can support people in accessing 311 if they're looking to, um, or other shelter options, as well as get people registered for coordinated entry and SRN, um, which are two of the centralized housing wait lists. Um, we can also accept referrals from other agencies doing housing work to make sure that people can access mental and physical health care. So we're really there to help people, you know, working on their housing, um, get connected to the mental health care um, to help them be successful once they move in. Um, to access support, um, to access the crisis team, you or someone on your behalf can call 800-322-8400 um, to speak to a crisis worker. And that line is up 24 seven um, staffed by crisis workers. Our mobile teams respond from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., seven days a week. So um, if you know someone is looking for an in-person response, it would need to be within those hours, but telephonic um, support can always be given. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, so thank you, Chris and Katie. Um, uh, we have you on speed dial at our office and we've always found you to be extremely helpful. So I wanna say a quick thank you again to all of our presenters for being here tonight. And I will now pass it on to my staff member, Maggie, who will lead us through our Q and A. Hi everybody, just to review, cause I know we still have people trickling in when we went over this at the beginning. I'm gonna be reading aloud questions that were submitted upon registering for this event. If time permits, we'll move on to questions submitted to the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. I wanna stress that we are writing down every question that comes into the Q&A box and we will be following up on them. So if questions do come up, feel free to drop that in the Q&A box. Our staff member is taking down all of them. Um, with that, I will kick it off with the first question that was submitted. So. Janet asks, why is there no mention of the Salvation Army? Um, hi, this is Maura. I can respond to that question. Um, so we didn't mention the Salvation Army by name, but um, when Chandra was talking about the transportation and crisis response, uh, transportation to shelter, that is Salvation Army is the nonprofit provider who, who does transportation and manages the centralized um, bed management for bed availability across our shelter system. 
when you call 311, a service request is created and that gets transferred to Salvation Army to begin the response and connection to shelter. Um, Salvation Army also operates the Evangeline Booth Lodge, a family shelter um, in Uptown. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, Jim asks, I understand that every single person living in the encampment is assigned a case manager. The fire a few weeks ago involved a campsite that had had been vacant for three weeks after the person living there died. Is there or will there be a process to remove the abandoned tents after someone has either passed away or moved on to permanent housing? Um, yeah, um, and thank you for just acknowledging that extremely um, sad, uh, sad situation of somebody passing away um, without a home um, first. And then second, we do have a process, um, Chandra, Chandra's team works with uh, the Department of Streets and Sanitation. Um, when we post for cleanings, we also um, go, the HOP team goes out to the location that is posted, evaluates, um, you know, works with the residents who are there to identify what may be abandoned and can be stickered. We give seven days notice for the cleaning and for removals of tents that have been stickered. So that's one way that we do that. We're also having conversations with the aldermen and other city departments about ways that we can increase the frequency of just identifying um, abandoned tents and, and getting those removed. Okay. Um, Jim also asks, I was once told that it's better for social service agencies that have the ability to be the ones to provide housing to also be the ones who provide food to the people in the encampments because it helps build trust that's needed to get them to accept other services. Does the city of Chicago still fund outreach programs like Salvation Army and the nighttime ministry that don't provide housing but still go out to feed the homeless? So we do fund um, 13 street outreach organizations. All of them are working, um, even if they don't provide housing directly, they are working with the housing system. So they are working really closely with Sarah Circle or Cornerstone um, um, and you know, on events like the accelerated moving events. So really critical in building relationships and then giving a warm handoff um, with the participant and the housing provider to make a strong connection. And that's the role that they play if they're not providing housing directly. John asks, can the city create a safe fenced in area for individuals experiencing homelessness to live in their tents? The fence could have adequate entryways on all four sides. It could also have bushes, greenery, porta potties, garbage cans, wash stations, et cetera. Um, so I can't, I can't provide a definitive answer to that question, but that is, you know, those are strategies that other, you know, cities have used. Um, we definitely look at other practices from, you know, cities across the country and take those into account um, in our own planning. Um, I think that decision involves multiple departments and other decision makers, um, but it is something that has come up and has been suggested for us to also look into. And, and this is Elisa Rodriguez. I wanna add that we want to provide the most digni dignified path for our residents. Um, and honestly, fencing them in and, and providing these services within a specific area isn't a dignified manner. Um, these are human beings and it is our responsibility to connect them to housing and to services. So, you know, um, again, like Maura said, it's, it's a bigger decision, but it is not one that, that I'm comfortable with because I really do feel that our, our responsibility is to support people um, and not to segregate them into areas just because they're homeless and putting them together so that, you know, the problem kind of like goes away, but it doesn't. Our responsibility is to house these people. Mark writes, the park cleanup of the tents along DuSable Lakeshore Drive was very effective. When is the next cleanup?
This is uh, Art Richardson from the Chicago Park District. We work very closely with uh, DFSS, um, Streets and Sands, as well as the Chicago Police Department and uh, CDPH. So what normally happens is as we are, you know, the situation is identified at a local park, we will coordinate with our partners. Um, and as Maura had indicated earlier, there is a seven day notice notification um, as far as before anything is moved around or it's is disrupted, the encampment areas are disrupted. As far as the specific date, um, if it has been uh, reported and it's on our radar and we've gotten in coordination with our partners, um, the, the cleaning or the moving, uh, moving in to try to support this population will begin seven days after the initial um, notification time or the, 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 the initial time that we've been notified that there is an issue of, of a particular encampment. Um, Nicholas asks, what properties are available for subsidized housing in Uptown? Uh, this is Alderman Kaplan, and I can step in there because I don't think any of the providers can answer this question. Um, any property is available for subsidized housing in Uptown. What it takes is for that housing developer to work with the Department of Housing and uh, the state, oftentimes using low-income housing tax credits and getting all types of funding together to, to make that happen. As I mentioned before with Sarah Circle, uh, it took years uh, to get the funding in place uh, for their uh, developments. And we have another one coming up at 835 West Wilson that also took a number of years. Um, the sad fact of the matter is the cost to build affordable housing is easily twice as expensive as building market rate housing. And so it's, it's getting all the uh, funding together that makes it so difficult. Lori asks, why is everyone's safety put at risk every day? Parents with a child must walk in the street to access the lakefront. The tents are blocking everyone's access. Why can't I use the park after 10 p.m.? So it seems two separate questions there. I can, this is Art again. I can speak to um, the 10 o'clock time period. Most parks along the lakefront, uh, the general shutdown time is 11 p.m. Um, again, we work very closely with the Chicago Police Department to make sure that the parks and, and programming opportunities are not um, infringed upon. And, and when they, they are, we work very closely with our partners to, in a dignified and a very compassionate way, um, try to make sure that the parks are available for all the Chicagoans to use. But in some cases, um, where there is a, a high level of a homeless or um, a shelterless population um, uh, accessible to this, that same space, um, we just try to work to make sure that we, in a compassionate and a very um, giving way, make sure that everyone has access to, to the parks. But the parks generally close along the lakefront. They close at 11 p.m., not 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. Um, CC asks, given that the policies and practices we've pursued for decades aren't working, have we or could we pilot programs in Uptown based on successful models elsewhere, such as providing apartments, hotel rooms, or tiny houses to the individuals experiencing homelessness? Um, yeah, more you. Yeah, I mean, so... Uh, I think that, you know, I can speak from the health department perspective, basically everything that we're doing is new. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the project I mentioned of us doing hotel purchases and then embedding very complex and individualized treatment was based on something we did early in the pandemic where we, um, as, as someone previously said, individuals that had a high risk of a bad outcome if they acquired COVID in the shelters or moved into shielding housing in a hotel setting. And then we evaluated, they, they got comprehensive healthcare in that setting. And our team actually published 
an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association that showed we had had statistically significant improvement in blood pressure and blood sugar control. And so after we did that, we said, you know what, we want to buy a hotel. Um, and we actually then want folks to be able to stay in it for up to six months. And we really want to focus and hone in on serious mental illness, untreated substance use disorders, and primary care altogether um, uh, so that we can support people and having a, a, a sustainable runway into permanent supportive housing. That's all new. Um, partnering uh, our mental health teams with uh, the DFSS expedited housing initiative, new. Um, the, the success we've seen with the flexible housing pool for high utilizers. I mean, that's that's all newer uh, stuff. So, uh, Maura, you can comment more to some of the specifics you're working on, but but everything really that the health department is doing is new as of two years ago. Yeah, I would just echo um, what Matt said. Um, pretty much all of the strategies that we talked about tonight are new ways of doing things. Um, one, to connect people to services faster and, and two, to ensure that they have the right level of care um, with whatever service that they get attached to, whether it is shelter, um, a hotel housing or a permanent housing program. Um, one thing I will add is that um, we did have um, in addition to Hotel 166, um, we DFSS released an RFP at the end of last year um, to be able to continue hotel housing, at least on a temporary basis, um, because we found um, individual rooms, not surprisingly, um, work much better, people are more comfortable, um, and many improvements, as Matt mentioned, happen. Um, and so we are currently operating, it just opened in um, April, earlier this month, um, 50 rooms um, at a hotel location, not in Uptown, it's actually near um, Midway. Um, but we are making referrals, or we're connecting our outreach providers directly to this resource. So if they engage people, people are more willing to take shelter when they know they can go into their own room than they are in a large space with many people. Any one of us would be more comfortable in that type of a setting. So it won't be for everybody, but people who do accept it and are interested in going are getting access to that. We're prioritizing older adults, chronically homeless individuals, couples um, who sometimes have to be in different parts of a shelter or different shelters right now in our system um, and people who are unsheltered um, for this program. Emily asks, how is the care pilot program going in our ward? How is its efficacy specifically with those experiencing homelessness and what percentage of people being helped with care or the care team are homeless? So good question. So, uh, the university of Chicago health lab, is evaluating care. So we have like an academic evaluator uh, that is working on it. We will be launching a public data dashboard shortly where you can check, it'll be up, the data will be uploaded on a weekly basis and it will show core outcomes, number of calls for service, how the calls are resolved. That's all gonna be public. And, and Alderman, I can share with you the link um, and with your team once it goes live so we can share it out with everybody that was here tonight. Um, and, and so you'll see most of that, those outcomes just on the dashboard. We will publish a much more detailed evaluation with the University of Chicago that will get into like long-term outcomes for everybody that we work with and things like that. But that won't be, my guess is it won't be probably a year before we have some of that data back, but the data dashboard, you'll, you'll be able to start referencing here real shortly. Awesome, okay. Jesus asks, are the efforts to address homelessness in our neighborhoods enabling these men and women to remain on the streets without addressing the core issues of why they're on the streets and making our community less welcoming, less safe? I mean, I can start by, so, you know, I'm a healthcare person. So, I, you know, people obviously become homeless for a variety of different reasons. I think 
Uh, one thing that we know though, you know, in the world that I work in is that untreated serious mental illness, untreated substance use disorders, their combination, untreated physical health conditions that become very limiting. A person might not, not be ambulatory, they can't walk anymore. Those things are very um, implicated in um, the development of homelessness or somebody staying homeless or unsheltered. And so I think the way that we've been trying to partner in a very intentional way with our colleagues in housing at DFSS and the Department of Housing and embedding healthcare services in a bunch of different ways is intended to exactly address that problem. Because if, if a person has become homeless, partially or primarily because, for instance, they have an untreated schizophrenia diagnosis, it's going to be really, really critical to get that person started on the right treatment um, in order for them to be able to achieve stability in the community, whether that's in permanent supportive housing, whether it's reuniting with family if disaffiliation occurred, um, whether it's um, living in, in some sort of uh, milieu environment with other people. Um, it's the same thing with physical health conditions. Our teams work all the time with people who become homeless because they had some disabling physical health event. Um, and until that health event is really addressed, the person is not able to get back to work, things like that. So um, the causes of homelessness I can address are the health ones. And that's exactly why we're working so closely between health and our housing agencies to address those pathways to homelessness, to prevent it from happening, and then to get people rehoused with the right supports so they can, so they can be successful. Laurel, Margaret, Villamira, and Stephen all ask essentially the same question. Um, what can be done to get individuals experiencing homelessness into shelters? And why are they allowed to be underneath the viaducts and in other visible places such as Irving Park and Marine Drive? So I think, um, you know, for people who are ready to accept shelter and are interested, calling 311, going to a service center, connecting with a street outreach provider, those are the ways to connect to shelter. Um, one of the things that I touched on very briefly um, in our presentation was that, and I think Matt has explained, is that there's many reasons people don't go to shelters. Sometimes the rules and policies um, are too much um, for somebody who's experiencing serious mental illness or some other barrier. Um, and people have had bad experiences. Um, and so one of the things that DFSS did about three, four years ago now was to open a low barrier shelter, which is a shelter that has increased services, like Matt was mentioning, to safely engage people. And in doing so, they're able to reduce like the rules and regulations. So you, for example, you could come in under the influence um, and we're gonna, the, the shelter's gonna have a way to engage you safely. Um, you can't actively use while you're in there, but you can be under the influence while you're there. So it wouldn't be a reason that you couldn't come in tonight or you couldn't come in when you got an intake. You can bring your pet, you can bring your partner, um, you can bring your same sex partner. You know, there's not, there, it's just very flexible. Um, food is available 24 seven. Um, there's opportunity to leave and come back within a certain period of time. Um, and it's just a model that we're pairing with our encampments. Chandra mentioned the encampment initiative. Before the pandemic, we were doing two week long, really ser service um, intensive, sustained um, encampment initiatives at encampments with 10 or more people, which you know includes the, the Lawrence and Wilson viaducts. Um, and Part of that would be bringing the, the, the mobile health team and the doctor, the behavioral health team, substance use teams, um, talking to people about the low barrier shelter and offering them the opportunity to go inside. And we had a lot of a success um, with people going in. And then once they you know, went in, some of their friends would go in um, and things like that. 
now this is in Pilsen and people, you know, really enjoy Uptown um, as a community. It's a welcoming community. Um, and so, and there's a lot of services there too. So one of the things that we're trying to do is expand the low barrier model um, throughout our shelter system and to open additional um, shelters um, over time that are low barrier so that there are um, low barrier options located throughout the city more than we have at this time. And if I could just add one thing to what Maura just said, I, I think it's critically important and, and, and many of you may already know this, but when we look at the health profile of people who are unsheltered versus sheltered, we normally see much more significant health complications in the unsheltered population that are partially contribute to why they don't wanna be in the shelter to begin with. And let me give you an example of that. So if, if you have a loved one uh, uh, or you yourself or someone in you, you know neighbor who lives with a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, that is a very common um, disorder that we see among chronically homeless folks. It often changes the way you process noise. It affects memory. Um, people become very socially withdrawn in the late stages of the illness. So they often don't wanna be around other people. You can imagine if you had a brain health condition like that, and then you're living in a shelter where there are lots of rules, where you're around lots of people, that's not um, an adequate setup. And so I think what uh, Maura is describing is the way we're trying to develop different types of settings that sit between shelter and permanent supportive housing that have the right mix of services connected to it. So ultimately we can help move people toward, towards permanent supportive housing. And I think it's just important to understand that's where I think the low barrier shelters become really, really important because there's a lot of folks that are not gonna say yes to a normal shelter, but if we have a low barrier option, they, they would be much more likely, I think, as an interim option to be engaged in that way. Um, Lisa and Ken ask similar questions. One portion is when will the lights underneath the Lawrence Viaduct be working again? And then both ask why are the encampments only or seem to be only an uptown issue after the explosions that could have harmed those experiencing homelessness or other residents in the area, we continue to let the problem continue, why? Um, I, Alderman, I don't know if you want to speak to the, the repairs um, piece. Uh, I can maybe just mention that um, I, I've been meeting with a number of different city departments, including CDOT, and um, uh, we are now working on the process to get all the repair work done so that the electrical lights are all working and, and under good repair. And I would just add that um, there are encampments across the city. It is not um, an uptown only um, challenge. And then I think this is probably gonna be our last question. And I just wanna stress again, the questions that we have not gotten to in the Q and A box, my colleague has been writing them down and we will be following up on them. Um, grab the last one. Maureen writes, we all want safe housing and to live in a safe environment. I want to know when the parks will return to being public spaces and not occupied by tents that make it unhygienic and unsafe for the public, including the tents at Maureen and Irving Park. I would like to know who is buying the tents and advocating for individuals to occupy public spaces as their homes. Can people build homes in the parks or park wherever they want without a permit? Why do the rules apply to only some people? Well, um, this is Art Richardson again from the Park District. I can speak uh, briefly to when the parks will return to being public spaces. Uh, we're working again tirelessly to uh, get to that space, get to that point. Uh, we know that the summer months are um, quickly approaching and we're looking to, again, work in a very compassionate, uh, safe manner with our partners 
to not only help to resolve this issue, but to give the park spaces back to the, the communities in which they reside um, so people can begin to recreate in the ways they are used to. All right. So um, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for our homelessness outreach and support webinar. I mean, you know, people have opinions on, on all sides of this issue. And, and I want to thank the presenters, uh, what they said. It was, it's extraordinarily complex. Uh, there's no easy answer. It's something that we're struggling with in Uptown and the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois and across this country. And, and so we continue to explore for answers. Um, uh, and with a lot of work, we're going to find them. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists again for joining us this evening, um, especially you, Andrew, because you COVID and you came. That's great. Uh, your wife is going to kill you. <laughs> but um, my office will be emailing um, out to everyone who registered for this event a, a one pager of all the resources and uh, discussed during this webinar tomorrow. And with that, I want to thank you for joining us this evening and wish you a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman.